so, all right. All right, we're ready when you are. Okay. All right, great. All right. Laura, hold on a second. Let me start and we'll start here. Where do we, get, where do we begin? All right, let me do it again. All right, and we'll start again. Laura, I want you to tell me about your practice because this is such an important time and I want to dig deep into it. Talk about sure, it. Sure, sure. Yeah, so Zula Fit is a mind, body, soul, fitness, and wellness community. Primarily, I work with women ages 40 and up, though certainly if you're kind of on your way to 40, you're starting mm -hmm. to think about these issues as well. Um, but it really is a genesis of me doing this work myself over a number of years, yes. you know, living my own talk, so to speak. And um, it, the business itself had sort of iterations over the years as I continued to evolve. And then about five years ago, it started to really connect. So Zula is it's just parts of my name, right? So Lara Zolke and then Z-U-L-A. Sure. So um, it's really about helping women make peace with food come back home to their bodies and then feel from that sense of empowerment of letting go of the, maybe perhaps it's physical weight or perhaps it's emotional weight or perhaps it's just the creative weight of I have something more in me that I want to express. So really this is just a path to helping women gain life. Exactly. Because when we're in a place in our lives where we're feeling weighed down, we feel like there's a song in my heart. In fact, I, I knew it was time for me to bring this work into the world. Several years ago, I was standing at the Louvre in Paris, and I was looking at an Impressionist artist. And, and so many of the Impressionists, um, you would see on their little cards about how they had this brilliant work and, and they were brilliant artists, but they wouldn't let their work out because of the time, because they were coming out of you know yes. very traditional times and they had this crazy art. And so I remember standing there and looking at this painting and I just got these tears in my eyes because I was like, I can't die with my story inside of me, nor can any of the women around me that have so much more to offer in the world, but yet feel stuck and weighed down because they, don't necessarily know how to move through the experience of being in their body. Because when we don't trust ourselves to feed ourselves, to yes. nourish ourselves, we have a really hard time really trusting ourselves in life because food is primal. And yes. we grow up with so many sort of distorted ideas of what what food is and we're so focused on what we're eating we mm -hmm. don't often understand why and so in that yes. why we can get really stuck because we don't really understand that we're using food to sort of connect and cope with life in ways that aren't necessarily the healthiest no and and we won't so you went on your first diet at age 10 age 10 what year was that that would have been around 1984. All right, so 84, you're mm -hmm. 10 years old, and you, you get a chance to, you get, and somehow your body image or whatever said that, said, wait a minute, yeah. this is. Yeah, it was, I, I wish I could say it was just like one moment, although I will say that was around the time that Weight Watchers really came out. You bet. And my mom had come home. Um, there was a Weight Watchers group forming at our little church. I grew yep. up in a very small town. Mm hmm and I remember her bringing home, I mean, it looked like Candyland because the, the, it was like a card deck and everything had colors and everything was associative to these colors and right. you swap these things and I was sort of fascinated. Now, before that, she always kept a stash of, do you remember the figurines, the bars? They were yep. like little wafer bars. I thought they were candy, you know, sure. I thought they were very fun. But I think on some level, you know, I sort of internalized this, that if my mom was doing this and that she was sort of living in this way, then perhaps, you know, and I started developing a story around that time internally of, I was always a big kid. I mean, I was tall, sure. I was very athletic, I played a lot of sports, I was a tomboy. And so I already sort of struggled with where did I fit because yeah. I didn't have, I wasn't little boned and really tiny like the other mm -hmm. girls. Um, and so I think I just de deduced that, well, this is what women do and mm -hmm. this is what I need to do to fix this problem of feeling not right in my body. And so it's that idea of fixing that I think a lot of women get stuck into, that get pulled into, well, I feel this sense of not rightness in my body. Yeah. So a diet is the way to, to, to serve me, right? Absolutely. Um, and but, that will fix right. what I'm looking for. That'll, right. that'll fix. Yeah. And that's the thing. An external will fix 
what is this Which, hole inside yeah. of me? Right, right. The Buddhists talk about uh, the, the idea of suffering and in, in that we often feel like we have a hole in our soul yeah. and, and that we use uh, symbolic substitutes in order to, to feel that, right, to feel that hole in our soul. And that's really what it's about. But certainly at age 10 or 15 or when yeah. I was borderline anorexic or 25, I didn't have the consciousness yet to really see that that this wasn't about the food at all. Yep. What it was really about when we seek those external substitutes, we really seek relief yes. to, to have a feeling of relief and we seek connection, more divine connection because we don't feel connected in our bodies. We don't feel that sense of I'm okay. And so I think there's um, a lot of, just a lot of issues that come up because of that. And so we don't really know how to trust myself with food because I'm using this food as a, as a way to cope. I mean, uh, and it's one of the most primal things that we have, even yep. as little children, is our sense of control of like, no, I'm not going to eat that food. Like, sure. so I'm going to throw a fit about it, right? Um, and so I think it's, we, so then by the time we land 40, 50, 60 years old, we've, we've probably struggled through countless numbers of diets, totally. countless pounds gained and lost, as I had. Um, but, you know, on July 6, 2017, after even all of this training and all of this self-work, mm -hmm. um, I was still feeling weighed down at that time of my life. And it was as if I just got the cosmic two by four and it just started becoming very abundantly clear that it was time to put a framework to put feet to my own prayers to develop a system. And so the work that I do is really around four key pillars though I have tools and uh, a free coaching program that can help women sure. get started. Um, because it's a really, you know, it's a lot of dismantling of the old paradigm that has mm -hmm. to happen. Uh, and that has to come with really being willing to just lean in and, and go on this imperfect journey of really coming back home to yourself. It's totally, I mean, just mm -hmm. like in the 12 step mo uh, movement, mm -hmm. that, that, that is a spiritual, it's a spiritual Point. Yeah. The, you, there, there is a power, whatever that is, mm -hmm. that could be the group, it could be the, our, a sponsor, it could be whatever, mm -hmm. but there's a power greater than we are because we are powerless, mm -hmm. that we are powerless left to our own devices to be able to say that, and, and, and the powerlessness, the part that, that really resonates with me is the idea is that my life has become unmanageable. Mm -hmm. Why? because people, places, and things aren't manageable. Mm -hmm. By definition, right. I can't control you. In other, I can't get you to fill that particular place within me. Yeah, that. yeah. Well, but that's what a lot of us do with food, shopping, drugs, alcohol, yep. you, know, you name it. And so I'm really, though, very focused in on the food aspect yep. because it is... Again, because I think when you, when again, when you, if even if you just look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you look sure. at this idea of, of can I trust myself as an eater, then how Thank do you. I trust myself in the world? And so that is the, oh. that's the foundational pillar upon which all that's of those one, other needs are, are met or unmet. What a great way to enter into the spiritual mm -hmm. world is through something that we must do. Yeah. Well, it is because it is a very spiritual um, eating is very communal. You know, yes. it's very it's very tribal. It's very communal. It's very soulful. Um, I, one of my favorite sayings is that we're taste buds for God. Yes. And, and it's that idea that as, at a more holistic level, we are in that we are in that divine expression. And so when we forget that and we begin eating, we kind of tune out, we disconnect from our bodies. We're not in that presence yes. because we're off somewhere else. And so I think because for so many women, foods become this idea, this sense of shame of mm -hmm. very rigid rules. And those rules are always changing based on whatever fad diets come out. It's, exactly. I mean, I arrived in my mid thirties when I entered the world of food psychology coaching, um, and really started studying dynamic food psychology of, of realizing like my whole life I'd been handed these rules that just didn't work for me because I was like, I, I don't want to live in this way in this very narrow box. And I knew that there, I started, as I leaned into my spiritual practices, I knew this wisdom was inside of me. In fact, we have more wisdom in our gut region. Mm. We have over a hundred billion neurons in our, hundred million, I'm gonna get it wrong, but yeah. lots of neurons in our belly, right? More than even in our brain. Um, 
that's why you'll hear it called the belly brain. And yes. in the in the energy world, we talk about the third chakra as the seat of personal power. Mm -hmm. Is because this is your inner sun. It the, the third chakra governs your whole digestive area. So your personal power, your sense of personal power, is very synonymous to how you feel metabolically. So it's the saying that we have in food psychology coaching of, um, you know, your personal power is e equal to and synonymous to your, your metabolic power, right? So yes. how you digest food is how you digest life. And so a lot of us have gotten really disconnected. And of course, there's lots of other layers to this, right? Sure. Certainly there's the emotional, but then there's also things like food quality. And am I choosing foods that feel nourishing in my body? Am mm -hmm. I, you know, eating too close? My, my whole thing is I don't, we don't count things. We don't, you know, there's no rules like that, but it's really about eating as close to the source as possible in a way that's sustainable. And I think that's the other key piece is that this isn't, this isn't a journey of like, let me just get to the next goal, right? right. It's really about how am I showing up for the rest of my life? You know, how am I aging into my best life? Like, how am I stepping forward into my greatest experience? Because it's not too late. You know, I'm, no. I'm writing the rest of my story from this moment on. And, and that's so, one of the things that I love about your, uh, uh, about mm -hmm. this particular slice from 40 on to the women that you're working with, because yeah. these are the change makers. These are the ones that are really going to, all right, the, the, the basic children, while you still can have a child, but in general, if we, uh, the childbearing age is over. Now it's the time to really to be able to be the change makers in the world. We're yeah. seeing it. We're seeing it on the presidential stage. We're seeing it at the legislative, at the at the corporate stages. Mm -hmm. What a rich thing! But and yet, there there it's fraught with self image challenges. Yeah. During that time. Yeah. Well, I think because so many women, you know, and I watch this, I don't have children of my own, but I watched with my mom by the time she hit 45, you know, she was working on a doctorate. And um, in, in, as we started leaving, you could see her sort of grappling with her sense of self. Like all Ugh. of a sudden my identity as a mother has now shifted. Uh, I just watched the movie Otherhood over over uh, the last yes. week and it's yes. that idea of Arquette like... Arquette and where, Arquette yeah, and all yeah, that. It's they're, like, they're, where did I go? Terrific. Please, please. Yeah. God, I it's love like, that. It's a, film. Great, it's a great film. But I think it speaks to that idea of like, and again, since I don't have children, I just sort of have watched on a peripheral level like right. uh, all of this happening. But I think it's that sense and even in my own life, um, of, of you're constantly in an evolution, right? Yes. You, you, you wake up, and I, I kind of tend to think of my sort of midlife wake up around the early 30s, where a lot of people have it 40 sure. or 50. But, you know, we tend to think of these things as like midlife crisis. No, it's just a midlife awakening because you've lived in this one model and this one idea of who you thought you were supposed to be. And then all of a sudden, as your life starts to pivot, it's, a, it's an awakening of where am I in my soul? Am I hungry? Where am I hungry for something more? And how can I show up and express that more in me, in the, in the world, in a, in a profound way? For some women, it's, you know, starting a nonprofit. For some women, it's writing a book. For some women, it's going off and teaching, you know, school or whatever, like changing their paradigm. Right. because. We're constantly in evolution, and I think the the woman that I heard an interview with Jane Fonda, um, not too long ago on the Oprah's Got a Masterclass podcast sure. that's fantastic with all types of artists and, and uh, change makers, and Jane Fonda said it so beautifully that when she arrived at fifty nine, she realized that she had been living her whole life sort of running from her past, very troubled past with her mother and kind of contentious, you know, distant relationship with her father Henry Fonda. But she arrived at 59 realizing, I don't really know who I am. And I'm just now mm. entering the second chapter of my life, if you think about, you know, the phases Absolutely. of your life. So who am I? So she said she spent an entire year just digging in, to being an archaeologist in her own family history to better understand the pathologies and the identities that she had been handed. And she did talk a lot about her own struggles with anorexia and bulimia and sure. this idea of being this perfect woman. And, you know, and I think for so many of us, it's it's coming to terms with the beauty of our own imperfection. So and being where, where in are you in this journey? Because you're yeah. about to, because as your yeah. business is growing, mm -hmm. as your publicity, as you're saying yes 
to the world, you're going to yeah. get a chance to experience things that you yeah. were either having hold, held, either you'd held yourself back from or right. you're having, so where are you? Yeah, well, and quite frankly, that's why it took me a while. I mean, it's why, it's why I did this training, you know, 10 years ago, I started iterating and teaching classes and, you know, we didn't have podcasts that didn't really come on the scene. I do have a podcast now called Fit Over 40. Um, where I talk about these issues, but but it, it's been my own journey, you know. As I mentioned, July of 2017. I mean, that was the, that was the whack. It was yeah. it was you know. There's no more waiting for you. And I I focus in my work not just on the physical weight, but the W A I T, all the waiting yes. that we do in life that we exactly. sort of hold ourselves back from. So this is I'm very much in the middle of this. I'm very much living it. This isn't like I've I've ascended to some place where I've so, gotten there. Like but, it is an evolution, right? Are, are you are you? Th this is. What makes it so exciting? Yeah, this is what it makes it exciting to talk to you because I mm -hmm. would much rather meet you now for me mm -hmm. as you are in the process of unfolding, yeah. rather than a fait accompli. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just fun. I'm having fun. This is my soul's work. This is my heart work. This is the this is my rest of my story. You know, I spent the past 22 years in marketing and in editorial production and journalism, and and I love it and it's wonderful. Yeah. But I I knew probably about 10 years ago. It's like you know. There's something more. And I think sometimes that stirring we feel for something more, we mistake it for a lot of other things. And that sort of divine discontent is like I like to call it of mm -hmm. there's something more in me that wants to come forward. And and how can I let that forward in the world? And so, you know, for me, it is very much living this. And so I put these the framework into practice that I that I teach. Um, and through that process, I've let go of, you know, 40 pounds of physical weight and sure. lots more of emotional weight and creative weight. Um, in the time, you know, I published a book and published my novel that I had been sitting on for years. And so it is very much a creative journey. You know, I, I tend to tend to believe that our creative expression and physical expression are two sides of the same coin because we so are we truth. are that God stuff in expression. Right. We are that divine stuff in expression. And so when we don't feel like we have the creative license to let our light into the world, we get really stuck. And I got really stuck for a number of years. Oh, totally, totally. And so, you know, uh, I've been very much consciously, intentionally, on purpose living this work for the past two, a little over two years. And, you know, and I, and I feel it and I, I, I don't look the same. I don't show up the same. You know, I don't think about myself the same. How has your, your self-image changed. I mean, my prayer to the universe is help me to uh, be more compassionate mm -hmm. with myself. Yeah. Help me to be gentle with myself the mm -hmm. way I would with a, a puppy or a kitten yes. or, you know, or a child or, or, or you. Yeah. I, I, can, I can be tremendously gracious to you and yet yeah. to me I'm, I'm vile and vi virulent and yeah. awful and, and so yeah. that, that, that process of shifting that inside. Yeah, it's a, it's a journey. You know, I think it's, it's part of our human experience to reconcile um, our humanity and our beingness, right? We are human beings. And and um, I realized that part of my shift for me was starting to really identify with my beingness and allowing my beingness to be the driver of this, the vision of this, not my humanity. Certainly, my humanity is very important in it, yeah. but but leaning into that larger calling, right, that divine calling. Um, you know, several years ago, as I was really starting to, to unpack and, and, you know, really heal a lot of the old body image and the mm -hmm. old diet mentality, um, I, ha I was journaling one morning. I'm a huge advocate of journaling. It's a big part of the work that I do with the, the women I work with. Um, and so I was sitting there one morning, and at this time in my life, I was enacting behaviors like overeating and binge eating and binge drinking. Um, yep because I was so, so desperately trying to figure it out. You know, I was grappling with trying to hold on. And I was, as I was sitting there, yeah, as I was sitting there and just, um, just in this quiet moment, it was this idea of getting this picture of me. So I found this picture of me when I was a little infant and I was a little round faced, you know, baby with no hair. And I put it on my refrigerator. And every time that I would hear that voice, that self-criticism, that self-judgment, mm -hmm. that self-denial, I'd go to that little baby, me, on the refrigerator and envision me saying that to that little child. And I couldn't do it. It just sat and wept. 
And it's that level of self-compassion and self-love that I actively bring to myself because in many ways we're still those little children that we've learned all these behaviors and all these things in order to cope with a world that we didn't quite feel quite right in. And depending on the level of trauma one may have experienced or sure. the level of, of just upset, there's a lot of stuff. And, and food becomes an escape for so many people. It does. And so certainly I'm not versed in very extreme issues of bulimia and, and overeating. Um, yep. You know, there's lots of different uh, healing modalities and, and, and groups mm -hmm. for that. I'm really focused on working with women who have kind of been in that middle fray yeah. of, you know, feeling somewhat, you know, like I kind of like myself today and maybe I really love myself in this one moment. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and the other thing I'd say, Dennis, is that one of the the other um, continuums that I work along is this idea that we can't move from, you know, going from a space of loathing to loving ourselves overnight. It is a it is a journey. And the way I tend to think of it as, you know, we've got fear on one end and love on the other. Well, the middle place to be is curiosity. So the more curious that we can become about ourselves, if I wonder why I do oh. this, or I wonder why I think this way, or I wonder why I eat this food at this time because it makes me feel better, wonder where that came from. So the more we can be in curiosity, the more we can lighten up on ourselves. And the more we can lighten up on ourselves, we can start to teeter in that space of looking back of like, oh, I kind of like that about myself. I kind of yeah. like that I'm curious and I kind of like that I'm playful and I kind of like that, that I'm learning. You know, I think a very, it's very much a practice of, of, of learning, of unlearning what we, uh, Adashante, who is a spiritual teacher, um, talks about spiritual evolution. It is, uh, I'm going to mess up the quote, but it's basically is the practice of unbecoming that which we are not. Yes. And so much of it is starting to un dismantle and disconnect from that which we are no longer, letting go of that old story and deciding what story do I want to write now, you know? And being, you get a chance to be there with your story rather than having someone define it yes, for you. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. That, that, that's, the, that's the thing about the media. Yeah. Right now, we have, because we're in the media and we're in the media age and we're getting a chance, there, there can be a false image of, I mean, you look at, you, you look at a show and, or, or you look at it and, and people are having to look a certain way in order to be able to be acceptable right. and get it pounded into us. Yeah, 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 it very much is. And, you know, and I think, but I think more than ever, we are, we are leaning into more body positive movements. We're leaning more into conversations of substance around these relationships that we have with yep. our body. And for me and my work, it's not a, it, what I, letting go of the physical weight is what I call the little goal, mm -hmm. really. It, and, and very much it's about understanding your why, like understanding your vision for, for who it is you seek to be. And so I just came across in the, my podcast this past week, um, I shared three lessons that I wish I had known, you know, sort of starting out in this journey. Um, but one of the things that I, I sort of discovered in looking back through my own journals was my why and my vision. And it had nothing to do with the scale. It had everything to do with who I was expressing as in the world. Yes. And so, you know, I think as the more that we can redefine um, our measures of success, you know, more the more that we can redefine how I feel in my body, that's really the litmus test for me. Do I feel like I can land here and be in this bodysuit. Can I land here and be in my heart? Can I land here and be consciously present and show up in my brightest light? And I, you don't have to have a certain size to do that. We're all these amazing expressions no. in this tapestry of all of that. But, but for, for women who feel like I feel stuck or heavy or weighed down, I mean, that's who are hungry for something more. Those are my, those are my women. Yeah. You know, I don't, I'm not looking for the quick fix. I'm looking to change my relationship with food and my body and how I move through the world. Would Laura 10 years ago been able to hear this? Uh, she'd want to. <laughs> you think she'd that want you could to. Um, because I mean, it's, we have to reach people where they are, yeah. not where they, so because yeah. I think about that. Yeah, one. yeah, and, and yes, I mean, I, I would want to, I would hear it in one way, I would hear it at the heart, in the mind, it would be a little different because there was still some of the dismantling that has to happen. And partly why I use some of the language that I do is very intentional because um, when we're stuck in this, that letting go of the weight is this way. I 
cut calories and I yep. move more, eat less, move more. When I right. have that paradigm or I'm on my fitness pal or I'm doing the latest thing, right. it's it's not sexy to hear that that this is a slow process. Like that letting go no. of the weight is in a sustainable way is and a I, slow I process. what you said about yeah. this, the little part. When, yeah. when people are, no, 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 that's the yeah, only that's part. The only Everything part. else. If, right. I, if I had that fixed. Yeah, I'd be fine. But it's not. But that's that's the lie. Like that's, that's the, the proverbial lie. lie. Like that's the dangling carrot. Because here's the thing, and this is the thing I had to really ask myself, is that if letting go of the weight, if if that was that letting go of that twenty pounds, let's say on um, Weight Watchers or fill in the blank, I'm not knocking Weight Maybe. Watchers, whatever, whatever yeah, diet it is, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. If that really worked, a wouldn't <laughs> one of those diets have worked by now? <laughs> Just one, instead of losing the twenty pounds and regaining it. But, but that's because there's a couple of reasons why that model doesn't work. One, it doesn't create sustainable changes because you're constantly thinking of it as I'm on the diet or I'm off the diet. Like it's always this on off thing. It's not a continuum. I'm not focused on making 1% little bit better changes today. Yep. I'm not focused on how am I gonna, if I'm gonna eliminate this food today and then I'm gonna lose the weight 20 pounds or fill in the blank. And then I, I, what happens after that? Yeah. Like, what's the next step? Oh, wait, I can go back to eating like I did, or I'm going to take some nibbles. And then all of a sudden, your 20 pounds is back. Or the you 20 haven't... pounds, and I want to interrupt you there, is because once the 20 pounds is gone, then the feeling of, the, relief? The, the, yeah. the, the, of going back, it doesn't, it doesn't, and we're back. Yeah. Well, we're back because you haven't become a person who has made the changes to live at that new story. Thank you. And that's the, that's the work I do How is do you helping. sell that? that? Because that is a very, very, that's a, oh, now wait a minute. Now that's a lot of work. Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I feel I like my work is. I don't mean how do you is, sell that. I, yeah. didn't, I, I didn't mean that by yeah. selling in the sense of because I can see your, your magnetism is palpable yeah. it's it really is i'm so so i can see where you're going to be connecting with people yeah. and you'll be able to when i say sell it i mean so that i understand from the very beginning mm -hmm. wait a minute yeah understand this is a journey well, and it doesn't matter where where yeah. and what spiritual evolution that there is and because you are so much on a spiritual uh path and and the teachings that that you do is that it's a journey, not a destination. Right, right. It is a hard sell. I mean, it, it's it's not the it's not the late night infomercial that's going <laughs> to promise you, you know, <laughs> like these massive results. But but as we grow in our consciousness on this earth, as yes. we grow in our awareness of, I mean, hello, Marion Williamson's running for president. Right? I know. So I mean, as we grow in our awareness, I mean, look at what Oprah on a main scale. I mean, it's at the, the, the top, yep. like at the little entry level of these conversations. But when the more we start to take a pause and and just ask ourselves, wow, is this old way really working? Yep. And I wonder if there's a new way. I wonder if there's a way at which this can be easy. I wonder if there's a way at which this can be fun. Because yes. I can tell you I haven't missed out on anything. I haven't missed out on any happy hours to let go of 40 pounds. I haven't missed out on any anything. But what I have brought is this awareness and this consciousness of just making a little bit better mindful changes. Yes. A little bit like that 1% rule, right, of making that difference. So I think... For the women who um, are ready for something more, my work is absolutely yeah. serving them very well. I, I, and I, I, love that, I love that as a concept. Mm -hmm. I love that as a concept because when you talk about these little tiny incremental, I don't have anything that I have ever done in my life, Laura, that I have done in a great big change and sustained it. Right. It's always been incremental and incremental and but being willing to sit there and to go, okay, incremental was okay. Yeah, yeah, it is because because the thing is is that in the middle of those little changes, you become a person who lives at your new destination. Yes, but but it, I don't have to wait. But, but I can it, live that right. now. Well, but and partly it's just neuro neurology, right? We just have to trick our brains. I've been listening to the the book uh, Atomic Habits by James Clear. I've been listening to the Audible book. It's a fantastic mm -hmm. book. But it's all about that idea of 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 shifting our habituated patterns of our brain because mm -hmm. it's just a groove, right? It's just a, a cue of I feel this feeling. 
Yes. It's a reward of I'm going to eat the ice cream. Yep. And then it's, you know, it's just a, it's a habituated loop. And so that becomes the groove in your brain. And until you can introduce. And so, you know, one of the best uh, tools, like when I was in the, the midst of my own healing journey with food, uh, there was a time in my life where I was feeling very stuck. It was around 2011. I had just moved to Austin, 2010-ish. And I would kind of go into this pattern of overeating. Like I'd have my dinner and then I would sit and just, I mean, all of a sudden it would just be like this carb frenzy of like popcorn and cereal and have some beers or walk across the street to Walmart, get some candy. Sure. And it just, and it just went on and on. And so as I would a journal about it and I could introduce, you know, my tools that I had through my training, uh, through my food psychology training, as I got clearer, what I realized I was craving was sweetness, mm -hmm. more sweetness in my life. And I wanted that through connection. And at that time in my life, I was feeling really disconnected. I was in a brand new city. I didn't have a lot of friends. And I was like, this is your call to step forward and find new connections. And the more that I brought a level of just, okay, I'm in the middle of this, the more mindfulness you can bring to these unwanted behaviors that you're doing, the more attention you can bring, the more you can start to neutralize. And so before I knew it, I wasn't doing that anymore. I wasn't reaching for the popcorn because in those moments where I'd feel that I'd call my friend, I'd call my mom, I would do something to, to interrupt that pattern of I don't need to just sit here and eat popcorn or candy or whatever <clears throat> in order to feel connected and to find sweetness. Yes. And so it's that level of understanding that's so simple but it's healing you at a deep level, and that's the work that I do. What a wonderful opportunity to talk with you today yeah. because it's lovely to see you here. Thank you. Because it's a journey. Yeah. This is our opportunity that we're going to have to do this over the entire time. We don't get it. There, there is no... There is no shortcut. Yeah, no. There is just our continuing way. <laughs> what yeah. a wonderful conversation. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for uh, having very, me. I, I, I was going to ask you at the end, right before we cut off, was to uh, tell me, is there anything that you had left out? But you didn't. You no, landed I hit it. it. The, way yeah. you, you, the, the, the way you hit it was exactly thank you. Uh, the place. And, and I, love, uh, I love the the evolution <clears throat> that you spoke about, you didn't speak about specifically, but the evolution that you're talking about, your evolution with your higher power, mm -hmm. whatever that means, yeah. is evolving. Yeah. I mean, there's a relationship there. Oh, absolutely. And it's, and it's, yeah. and it's so cool to yeah. watch. Thank you. It's so cool to yeah. be in your presence. Thank you. As you are being present. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. May I? Wonderful. Well, All right. That's a wrap. Thank you. It was fun. I was like, oh gosh, we're already done? Okay. Thank you, Bradley.